So really what we need to do is help people realize they're already loved, already forgiven and already reconciled from God's perspective. They just need to realize it and enter into it. Which makes it so much easier. Now, the way I do that with people is not to get them into an intellectual exercise. It's to do it by encounter. When someone meets God genuinely, they have absolutely no doubt that God loves them. How did negative treaties start with Satan before time? Uh, oh, that's an interesting question. Um, in terms of negative trading, um, it's a, it's a subject which you know I look at personally and look at in the things in my life where I uh, exchange something for something else. So, and they're often shortcuts, and they're often given to you as opportunities of making a shortcut but there's always a cost um this when it, question um, came from your book by the yeah way. when okay. it comes to before the fall of the world before people fell lucifer fell from his position as uh, an angel of light and the music bearer of heaven um and that was all because of i will statements i will ascend i will be like god you know um now as at that resulted out of jealousy for his understanding of man's role in creation as sons and there was a uh, a sense of jealousy he left his position which was to help man ascend having been on the firestones of god and walked in the in the garden of god and in that place discovered his role to reflect god's glory to man um chose to take a different path um so in terms of trading he traded his position in in heaven for a potential i will ascend but obviously the result was he fell from his position and fell into darkness and deception and lost his position in terms of what he would be doing with mankind and everything else um but when it comes to how trading takes place i tend to look at the positive side of things and there's a positive side of trading in which what you do in in covenant relationship results in we're in covenant with god so what god is ours and what's ours is god so if i give myself to god then the i receive from him um, and there's a positive side to that um, the negative is where I'm offering a sh offered a shortcut and that shortcut leads into a negative position because there's a cost. There's always a cost to a shortcut when it comes to relationship with God. And it's the same thing that Lucifer offered Jesus in the wilderness. You can be above all these things if you just bow down to me. That was a shortcut. That was a trade. He would have traded actually his real position for one which was a deceptive false position and he would have lost his real position. But of course he didn't. So he didn't succumb to those temptations. Um, he, he had an answer for each one, which was to quote God effectively as father um, and not succumb to the same temptations that Adam and Eve or Eve did. You know, Adam didn't get deceived. He chose um, to follow Eve. Now, in a sense, you know, each of us will probably have different weaknesses in our lives and needs, which a trade could function in. Um, and there will be lots of different ways. They're spiritual. They're not just spiritual in a sense. They're practical. So one of the one of the uh, trades um, is for intimacy and in a sense, pornography is a substitute for real intimacy. And so for a shortcut to something, you lose out on real and you end up in a addiction to that. And there that would be the same for finances, power, position each of them i will give you this position if you pay this cost 
now often the deception is not dressed up in with the cost that is hidden within the deception and therefore you offer a shortcut i remember when i was um, first involved in ministry in church planting i was uh, in a um, situation where i helped establish a church um, and there was a sort of main leader of the church um, and he used my desire to be a sort of full-time leader to get me to do all sorts of his dirty work and i look back and think i traded that for position and i wanted his approval and then, yeah we're talking about you know 30 years ago but in reality i look back and i think i would have never have done the things i did because he asked me to do it i was looking for both his approval and his position or a position in that sort of full-time role um and i did things that i now look back and think oh, i just wish i'd never done that now there was it wasn't bad things but it was things that he didn't want to do that i did on his behalf and you know there were some unpleasant things you know and things where i had to challenge people over certain things and and, and it wasn't my position to do it but i took the trade you know and in the end of it you know it lessened my um own value and worth really um, and there's lots of different trades you know in the different seven trading floors that are the ones that most people connect to um, but you know they're all potential traps that we fall in when we don't know our true identity and we're not secure in it and that's the main thing if you know who you are you won't fall for those traps but the enemy knows how to play on our insecurities and our on our needs and uses those needs to trap us into behavior which you know contradicts who we really are but anyway so yeah that's great thank you Mike. yeah most of the details on trading floors I can't remember because when I dealt with them, God just took the memories away of them all, mostly. And I have to sort of think hard to try and even think about a practical example of, you know, what happened in my own life. Because I don't like to, to talk about theoretical positions. I'd rather sort of say, well, this is what I did or this is how it worked in my life. But I can't remember an awful lot of them. Um, they just seem to fade away once I had so I acknowledged looking at my past where I had sort of fallen for those deceptions. Um, but as I acknowledged them, um, a lot of them just got taken away, which was great. You know. So we've had um, Resurrection Sunday just recently um, yeah. in the U.S. we've had this, uh, I don't know if you've heard of this eclipse that just um, occurred this oh, past yeah. week, a full <laughs> yeah. uh, solar. So it got dark midday, oh, street God. lights came on yeah. uh, in the middle of the day. So it was mm. quite uh, unusual. Um, and then um, and then we just had this uh, um, Middle Eastern situation that flared up over the weekend. Yeah, clearly um, a, a need, and we can speak for into unconditional love there, and lots of forgiveness uh, for all parties. But anyway, just wanted to talk about um, the the resurrection. You know, um, Resurrection Sunday, um, what it means, uh, what with Jesus going to the cross, and and not just, you know for for two thousand years the church has really focused in on victory over sin, mm. but it seems like. Uh, the ecclesia uh, sons are rising in an understanding and a thirst and a hunger for not only the victory over sin, but victory over death and decay as well mm -hmm. uh, at the cross. So just wanted to put that out there with regard to the full restoration of everything Jesus was victorious mm -hmm. with at the cross. And what's your perspective on that? Um, when I... Um... When I sort of 
historically would think of the resurrection, it would have been very much focused on what Jesus did um, to overcome death um, and defeat sin and all of that. Um, but as, as I have experienced more of what Jesus did and my part in it and the fact that I was included in it, so when Jesus died, I died. When he was buried, I was buried. When Ooh. he was resurrected, I was buried. I was resurrected. But I am the same as the whole of mankind in receiving what happened at the resurrection. It wasn't just an individual thing for people who in the future accept what Jesus did on the cross and through the resurrection. It happened as Jesus was resurrected he promised to come back and bring people into a resurrection relationship with the father. And I think John 14 is the best illustration of that in Jesus promise that he was going to go away, go to the cross, come back and take them to be where he was. Now, I am, he said, where I am, you may be also. Now, I am was not a physical location. It wasn't a spiritual location. It was an, a relational position. So Jesus then in John 14 talks about, I am in the Father and the Father's in me. And people have taken John 14 to mean, oh, Jesus has gone into heaven. And one day, you know, he's going to build a house there for us so we can all go and live in that house, live in our house in heaven because he's going to come back and he's going to take us there you know and that that teaching has placed what jesus did in the resurrection only in the future after we die when we get physically resurrected therefore we expect death and resurrection in the future on based on what jesus did well actually that's a completely wrong understanding of that passage the passage is really talking about the union of relationship we have within I am. And it was a reunion thing because John 14, one to three is a marriage statement in the Hebrew marriage. The, when they got betrothed, the sort of bridegroom, if you like, would go and build a house. So he would go and usually in the Hebrew culture, they would build a house on the on attached to their father's house. And he he would say, I, I am going away to prepare a place for you to his future wife. And she would say, when are you coming again to take me to yourself? And this was a well-known sort of understanding where we read John 14 in a today's culture and we can easily completely misunderstand it. So Jesus was basically saying, I am going to the cross. And through the cross, I'm going to prepare you to be a place where I can dwell, where you will be in I am just as I am in I am with the father. And then I think later on in the chapter, he says on that day. You will know that I am in you and you're in me and we're in the father. On that day, that was the resurrection day. And literally, he came back, went into heaven, received the kingdom, and then came to his disciples and breathed onto them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. And therefore, that was the moment where the disciples were represented, received of the new man in Christ. Whereas Adam was represented of the old man when God breathed into him. He then, everyone died in Adam. When Adam walked into death, everyone died in Adam, whereas everyone has been made alive in Christ. So the whole of mankind was represented in Christ when he went into death, when he went into the grave and when he was resurrected. And when he, Jesus breathed onto the disciples, they experienced the Holy Spirit filling them or coming into them. And the whole of mankind had the spirit come into them, but they didn't know because they'd not had the relationship with Jesus or the spirit that the discipleship 
the disciples had. So they had already a relational connection that became very different because God then came to dwell in them. But God came to dwell in all mankind. But most of mankind has not come into a knowledge of that or an experience of it, even though it's true. But God is at work in everybody to reveal that truth. So the power of the resurrection over physical death applies to everyone in the if we embrace what jesus did and we partake of what he did we also do not need to die because jesus basically said if you eat my flesh drink my blood in other words if you partake of me then you won't die so immortality is the consequence of embracing the power of the resurrection jesus overcame death and we were in him overcoming death now to start with you could say that was spiritual death but it didn't stay spiritual because jesus's death wasn't just spiritual his body died and that meant when his body was resurrected that was the first fruits of our resurrection now the teaching of the church over you know the last you know thousand or so years um has lessened what jesus said and made the power of the resurrection only really to do with salvation it has not applied that to uh, wholeness and and health or immortality so that that life has been well i get spiritual life but i'm going to die again and i'm going to go to heaven when the resurrection will take place for me Whereas actually it's, it is designed to take place now. And Jesus being transfigured before he went to the cross was an illustration of that, that we were to be transfigured and to become who God intended us to be as light, if you like. Um, God is light. Um, so there's so much more to the resurrection than Easter Sunday. You know, because Easter Sunday really only focuses on, well, Jesus is alive, so I'm saved from the consequence of sin. But actually, the consequence of sin is not punishment, which is what most salvation teachings focus on. You're going to be saved from punishment. You're going to be saved from hell. You're going to be saved from some future punishment rather than no you're going to be saved from death because the wages of sin is death not punishment and in hebrews talking about in context in terms of jesus being the one sacrifice the context there says it is what a person dies once and then they're judged effectively but that's not a future judgment that's a present judgment where God says you are declared innocent based on what Jesus did on the cross because Jesus took away the sin of the world. Now, sin is not behavior. Sin is a noun, not a verb. It is something we have. And actually, the word sin really means lost identity, not wrong behavior. Wrong behavior may come out of lost identity, but it's not the cause lost identity is what jesus came to set us free from so if he has overcome sin he's overcome lost identity to save us from being lost because the word perish you know god so loved the world he gave his only begotten son whoever believes in him would not perish the word perished is be lost that's what it literally means like the lost coin like the lost son like the lost sheep they were lost they were still, they still belong to the father. They still belong to the woman. They still belong to the shepherd, but they were lost. And it's the lost identity that Jesus overcame to give us true identity in him. So it carries so much more than just what we have been taught in the sort of evangelical version of salvation. You're saved from hell. Well, we were never saved from hell. We were saved from death. That's what we were saved for. And in death was that lost identity because Adam walked away from the life that was in God to follow his own path. 
and the whole of mankind it says according to 1 corinthians 15 died in adam but it also says the whole of mankind is alive in christ the same all all died in adam all were made alive in christ so that is the power of the resurrection it has brought the whole of mankind to be born from above when the holy spirit engaged each person you know but we've turned that into that only happens if you do something so if you pray a prayer then you will be born again and the holy spirit will come into you actually that is the completely the opposite we're already born from above through what jesus did we were dead and now we're alive so we've been born the second time if you like from above and now we live with the potential for to live immortally now that isn't just that we won't die one day that we would have the full quality of eternal life which is way more than just not dying um but the resurrection is the point where we say jesus overcame death we were in him so he overcame our death um, but it carries with it then the what is life because jesus promised us abundant life you mentioned right now about sin um actually being lost identity yeah and um and it's just because my husband and i like we're we're just we're learning so much and so i would i actually wanted to know um where where i can possibly reference that just so that i could have it in mind and then also if sure. if friends because we have yeah. very religious well, friends and how yeah. i can speak <laughs> yeah. well the word the word sin is a okay. noun yes. in in the greek language harmatia which is the greek word for sin is a noun not a verb so a noun is something you have or something not something you do and the word harmatia is from the root word har meaning a negation or loss and martia coming from the root miros which is image or form so there um, is a, loss, uh, a form or image so we were created in the likeness and image of god and we lost that therefore yes. creating our own identity through what we do rather than the identity we have in him therefore the church really plays on sin as a as a you do wrong things to keep you in line so if you're focusing on behavior then you have to maintain a standard of behavior to be acceptable to god and to the church and therefore if you do something that contradicts their standard of behavior then you could be in trouble or excommunicated or have to leave the church or whatever else whereas actually if you see sin is something that you have you have this lost image jesus came to restore our image to restore our form and he renews our mind to come into that image that he has of us so another word which again is wrongly translated is is the word for which is in english translated repentance which actually is a latin word which means do penance over and over whereas in greek the word there is a completely different word which actually words is agree with god's mind it's nothing to do with penance repentance as we know it as being sorrow for your sin or whatever nothing to do with that at all the word itself is a completely different word and you get that word where it talks about um having our mind renewed it means agreeing with god's mind and i think that is the the key to understanding a lot of things is realizing that sometimes the bible um has been translated using greek so the word metanoia meta and noia 
where we get the word mind, nous, you know, um, meta, with, noia, mind, with mind. So when I agree with God's mind, I am operating from that point of my mind is changed to agree with God. It's nothing to do with penance. But that keeps the whole system going in church. Because you go to confession in the Catholic Church to penance, do penance, whatever that penance might be. And in the Protestant Church, you have to repent. Therefore, you've got to be sorry enough for God to forgive you. God's already forgiven all of us for everything. Everything was taken to the cross and nailed to it. 2 Corinthians 5.19 says that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not holding anything against anybody. So that whole system of sin, repentance, penance, maintaining a standard of behavior is what the church thrives on. So it thrives on making you feel guilty and ashamed enough to change. Well, actually... I change when I agree with God about myself. Because no one is a sinner from God's perspective. Because we're all been made the righteousness of God in Christ. So our identity now is righteous. Not identifying with our past behavior, but identifying with the position that God has placed us in, which is his righteousness. So I am the righteousness of God in Christ because he made me righteous. I didn't earn righteousness not by my performance or standard of behavior. So I don't have to maintain a standard to be acceptable to God. I am acceptable to God as I am. Now that doesn't mean that I think, oh, great, I can go around and do whatever I want. Why would I want to do that? Because my mind is in agreement with God of who I am, his son. Therefore, I'm going to operate like my dad. Because my identity comes from my dad, not from the world, not from my past life or what from anyone else says I am. My identity comes from who God says I am and therefore my relationship with him. And that changes the whole perspective of the fact that we can live free from guilt, shame and condemnation. There is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, it says in Romans 8. You know, because jesus has overcome the law of sin and death with the spirit of life in christ so there's such good news to what real salvation is that people need to get and the religious system thrives on keeping people in being sinners saved by grace well i'm not a sinner saved by grace i am a saint i am righteous so if my identity is righteous, then how am I going to operate out of righteousness? If well, I keep being told that I'm a sinner and God sort of saves you by grace, but he doesn't really like you. Yeah, you know, he just saves you by grace, which is sort of the implication that seems to come over through that whole teaching. It seems to make people feel lesser of themselves, whereas actually God wants you to know exactly how he feels about you how much he loves you, how he has accepted you, how ha he has made you righteous so that you can live from the true identity of, of being a son of God. You know, so, you know, the word has been mistranslated. Many words are trans mistranslated when they have a Latin base to their understanding. Now, the Latin version of the Bible, the Vulgate version, which was Jerome's Bi Bible, which was translated in a, in sort of, I think, the fourth century. That version held sway for 1200 years or so, you know, mostly up until the Reformation, when they started to print the Bible in English and other languages. But they still used the Latin as the base to translate it rather than the Greek. So when they translated the King James Bible, they had a Greek text, but they always defaulted to Latin meanings. Otherwise, they wouldn't have translated uh, metanoia, repentance, because it has no connection to repentance at all as a Latin form, because the Catholic Church wanted you to do penance. 
all the time. You know, and therefore the Latin church sort of in that period functioned in keeping people guilty. So they had to keep doing penance all the time because that suited the system. You have to go and confess to a priest and do whatever. And therefore there were things like paying indulgences that you could buy your way out of problem. I mean, it was a pretty corrupt system based on wrong understanding of God. Because Jerome, who translated that that version in in Greek if from the Greek originals into Latin, followed Augustine. And Augustine was someone who never really understood grace. He always felt dirty from his past life because he didn't realize and fully embrace the fact that he had been completely cleansed from his position of lost identity. But he maintained his identity and therefore never felt good enough and therefore led the church, him, Tertullian and others, down a pathway which was completely alien to what most of the early church believed. But that became the predominant way. And of course, that controlled most of the um, church system until you know the, the Reformation came. And you, you had some groups all the way through that, like the Anabaptists and others who began to realize that this was not just this religious system operating on sacraments, but you could have a relationship with God and they would get baptized, you know, as an adult into that. And then you obviously had Luther who came along and then reintroduced, you know, justification by faith and, you know, had these 98 or five theses of where the church had gone wrong. Then people picked up on that and they then began to, you know, bring that different thing that you didn't need a pope or a priest, a priesthood of all believers. You know, so many things started to get recovered and rediscovered, if you like. You know, but, you know, that led eventually to evangelicalism, which actually then tied it all back down. You know, so that brought it back to a uh, a way which really was legalistic. I'm new to this, uh, shall I call it, stream of thinking. And yeah. so I must confess I am only an eighth into your book, um, The Eschatology. Oh, so uh, I'm nervous to I mean, ask did, any questions. That's okay. I mean, did you read any of the other books first? No. Okay, no. well, that, that's jumping in at the deep end. Okay. <laughs> okay. Well, my, fir my first book, which was my journey beyond beyond which is a much shorter book a couple hundred pages is a good place to start and with my testimony that really of how i got to the place where i could engage god see in the spirit engage heaven and all of those things you know okay. and then the next book then followed on from that so you're sort of jumping in at the deep end with that book but you can ask any questions you like about it no problem so my concern is uh, I'm going to ask you a question that perhaps is already answered in the book. So forgive me if I do that. Sure. But um, what I'm really um, grappling with myself, I am a student. And mm. uh, the book I'm currently studying and writing about is, is called Anatheism. Mm. And um, the term itself really refers to, uh, it asks the question, how do we return to God after the death of God? Or rather, how does God come back after God died? And um, of course, it's largely referring to the God of religion. Yeah. Um, but as as I am, you know, reading the material and um, processing it, and I read your book, and and I mean, the person who who loaned me this book um, is someone who's been in my life, uh, you know, for decades. So. Mm -hmm. That kind of thinking has been part of my life for some time, but here, here is more or less, I hope I can package my question properly, um, pluralism. Yeah. Uh, so anatheism, um, I am in a community and it's nice to know you've been to Stellenbosch. One of the accusations against Stellenbosch is that there is a lot of intellectualism and a lot of intellectual pride. Yeah. And uh, my social circle, I, I would say, is 
but got a fair percentage of atheists, very mm. confident atheists, mm. who would challenge me and say, why do you insist that there is something rather than nothing? Mm. And then on the other spectrum, there's a lot of uh, strong charismatic evangelical uh, 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 segment in Stellenbosch and yeah. you know I'm part of some of those churches which says um, there is someone rather than nothing and that's Jesus and if you don't repent if you don't um, call him Lord and Savior then things aren't going to turn out well for you so somewhere yeah. in the middle you know anatheism uh, it's it's an Irish philosopher who coined the term um, uh, Richard Carney and he says way to from here so the death of god is referring to the expected process of secularization where your your secular cities your your post-secular man and woman is less and less amenable to um specificity to dogmatic certainty where there's only one way and that is jesus and here's the yeah. sacred text then you must read this etc etc and anatheism is, is saying, is there a third way? Is there a way? So my, my thesis is titled um, A Faith Beyond Theism and Atheism. Mm. And I'm, even I have no idea how I'm going to answer that. But it seems to be the, a thrust towards pluralism and universalism. And yeah. uh, I can understand why. But listening to you now again, saying that really it's lost identity, and restored identity is found in Christ, which yeah. again is specific, and mm. it's it's so it brings back sort of the the dogmatic specificity. So, mm. can you help me? How are we going to bring God back after God's left? Well, well, God never left. No, uh, is our view of God, which has was warped by religion. See, God has never left. God has never turned away from us. We have turned away from him and followed our own way. So he has always been looking to help us return to relationship. And this is the key to it all. It's relationship. It isn't a religion. It's not something we have to do. It's something he has already done to restore us to re relationship. And that it was done before the foundation of the world. He'd already ensured that we would be returned to face-to-face -face innocence in relationship with him and he ha has done everything to make that possible now the evangelical way of looking at it is god can't look on sin therefore he has to turn away from mankind until mankind repents and comes back to him that is a completely wrong understanding it's like god never turned away from us ever and God has never stopped looking at us. And there's a really good um, YouTube video called The Gospel of the Chairs. It's by a guy called Brad Jerzak, who was a charismatic and now sort of operates within um, the Orthodox Church. But he very much is coming from the perspective that our view of God in the evangelical gospel is a complete adulteration of what god really is and who and what he's done so we turned away from him he turned back to us so the premise is two people are looking sitting on chairs one's black and one's white they're looking at each other and the one on the black chair turns away and turns away but the one on the white chair picks the chair up puts it around and then starts looking back at the person and then the person turns away and the picks the chair put it and it's like God has never, ever turned away from us. So how we go back into a relationship with God isn't something we do. It's realizing what God has done. So salvation is not something as a result of our repentance, our faith. It's like I don't need faith to believe in a God that I know I've met. So we've pushed faith. But if you think of I have been saved by grace through faith. That is not my own, but a gift God has given me. It's not my faith that saved me. It's God's faith in me that saved me. And he did that on the cross and through the resurrection to the whole of mankind. So the whole of mankind is already accepted by God. 
already loved by God, already forgiven by God, without doing anything. What is missing is the realization of that. And religion has made it really hard for people to accept that because the religion says you're not good enough. You have to do something for God to accept you again. Therefore, you've got to come to through Jesus. Basically, Jesus has already accomplished for God everything necessary because God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. And that word world is cosmos. God was in Christ reconciling the cosmos to himself. He already did it. It's already done. But people don't know that. So they're living in ignorance of what has already been done. So when they come to a realization of what is already done, they just have to accept what's already done. It's really easy to accept what's already done. If you're told you have to do this, this and this or else, because the premise of if evangelical theology is if you do not accept jesus you will go to hell if you read my second book you'll realize that i completely debunk that notion of hell that hell doesn't exist that way if you don't come to god in relationship then he will then encounter you in love until you do come to him in relationship because he'll never give up and love never fails so it's nothing about what we have to do to return to God. It's actually realizing what God has done to enable us to have a relationship with him. Completely different understanding. Just uh, thank you for that. Um, however, if we are, and I, I know this is all sounds very egoic, but if we are the ambassadors of what you have just said, so we understand that. We understand everything you've just said, but we are the face of this truth. Yeah. And people are rejecting it because of the face they've seen for one and a half thousand years. Well, how, yeah. if, I, if I can put it crudely, That's how really... do we re repackage the image of the truth? Because we have to help people awaken to the fact that God is love. And his love is unconditional. You can't have love which is conditional. If you put a condition on love, it says, I will love you if you do this. That's not love. That's earning something, a reward. God loves us unconditionally. Therefore, there are no conditions to his love. None whatsoever. And if we can help people understand that God loves them as they are. They don't have to do anything. They don't have to change. They just need to embrace that love. And when they know that God loves them and they experience his love, their whole lives will change. But what we've done is tell them that they're not acceptable to God and therefore they have to do something to become acceptable. The real message is you're already acceptable to God because he loves you unconditionally. I mean, you know, I've done, I mean, I think I did a 23 part series on unconditional love um, for my patron things. That really goes into the whole thing of debunking hell, of going through why unconditional love is so important for us to realize that God loves us because God is love. Religion will put conditions on being loved, but unconditional love says, I love you as you are. You are my children. I love you. There is nothing you can do to stop me loving you, but you can enter in and experience my love because I love you. So really what we need to do is help people realize they're already loved, already forgiven and already reconciled from God's perspective. They just need to realize it and enter into it. Which makes it so much easier. Now, the way I do that with people is not to get them into an intellectual exercise. It's to do it by encounter. When someone meets God genuinely, they will have absolutely no doubt that God loves them. What I would do with people, because this is how I engage God myself, I get people to close their eyes. I get people to then start to just come to a place of rest, meditate, if you like, or you know, fix their thinking on something and normally i might say picture a door that door is a symbol of your choice that you are opening up possibility for relationship with god so open the door god will meet you and god does meet people 
whichever way sometimes people have an have a visual experience some people have an emotional experience some people have different experiences but god will meet them because god is committed to bring people into a restored relationship with him not on the basis of you've got to do this first if there's any changes to be made they happen afterwards when we come to realize that some of the things we think and some of the experience we've had need to be healed when we need to be made whole and our mind needs to be renewed to start thinking in a true way rather than in the way we may have been deceived into thinking about ourselves about others and life and therefore god will take us through a process of renewing our minds deconstructing our belief systems about him the world ourselves so that we can actually know the truth because the truth that you know will set you free but you have to know it by experience, not intellect. You know, in, in, in both Hebrew and Greek, the word no was not intellectual knowledge. In fact, they, neither, they didn't have any intellectual knowledge. They didn't have a concept. Well, I can know you because I've read about you. They, that wouldn't compute to that culture. I could only say I know you if I'd met you and we talked and we had some sort of relationship. That means knowing. So actually knowing God and the word know in Greek is really the same word as I know a person in intimacy. Therefore, I can't say I know about God or I've read about him in the Bible. I need to know him. And that knowing is a relationship, which is really what we focus on. You know, we focus on the relationship that God wants us to have with him. You know, and god already loves the person and actually most people carry some characteristics of god in their lives and therefore you could connect them to god by the things that they like doing in their lives often so you're helping them see that god is already at work in them and wants them to know him rather than they're sort of separated from him and have got no chance unless they do this repentance and things through jesus and jesus isn't very precious about his name you know, he's quite happy to be the light or the truth or the or love or what. He don't he don't mind how people come. Yeah, we've made it. You've got to come through Jesus. Jesus is the door for us to engage the Father. And there isn't a one way only to engage that door by repentance and all that stuff. The door is open. So we just come through the door that's open, not through some religious formula that opens the door. The door's open. It's always been open since Jesus opened it for us. So he's made the way. But actually, religion and Christianity has made it so difficult that most people have rejected that version of God. Because that version of God is angry, needs appeasing, because... You have to do something to make yourself acceptable for him any, again, rather than, no, God is an unconditionally loving God and he just wants you to know that he loves you unconditionally. End of story. How can I help you find and meet with God who will show you that he loves you unconditionally? That makes it simple and experiential rather than intellectual and theoretical. Because I can't argue someone into that position. You know, it won't work. You know, they could argue themselves out of it because it's an intellectual argument rather than an experience once someone has a testimony of meeting with god that testimony remains the foundation of what they then continue to go on with in relationship so testimony is so powerful um you know i can't tell you that you didn't do this or didn't do that if you did it you know you did it therefore your testimony is solid and nothing i can say to you can say what you what you're saying you did is wrong or you didn't do it because you know you've done it so you have a you have experiences in your life that you know are true if i told you they're not true you're not going to believe me so we have to help people experience god so that then they can say i know this is true because i have a personal experience of it rather than well i've got this sort of belief or I've got this faith because Christianity is taught blind faith. When you meet God, you don't need faith. Why would I need faith? Faith is the evidence of things you've not seen. 
I don't need faith in God because I've met him. You know, I dwell with him. He dwells in me. I don't need faith to believe that. That is true. It is my personal experience. But we've tried to get people to believe something they've never experienced. Why would they? Thanks, Mike. That's, but probably that starting with my second book would be better than the third <laughs> one, which is the restoration of all things, which yeah. is about the restoration of relationship and the nature of salvation and all of that, rather than the third book is a much more technical book about a particular subject. Um, whereas the second book really goes into my experiences, uh, that how God revealed himself in love and how then that sort of debunks our notion of hell, notion of salvation and the evangelical sort of experience, because God wants to encounter us in love. You know? So I've been trying to figure out how I'm going to frame this question. So I, I guess for the last couple of years, I've been on this deconstruction of the notion of an angry God and, and that he's actually loving that yeah. the father is not, there's not a dark wrathful side of the father that Jesus saved us from, but that they're one. If you've seen Jesus, you've seen the father in him is light, no darkness at all. And I only discovered uh, your videos maybe a month ago. So I'm really mm -hmm. new to this. I haven't read any of the books yet, um, right. but the Lord's had me on this journey of the past couple of years where I've, I guess my internal state has shifted so much. I've gone out of, out of fear and guilt and shame to just complete peace. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but you, you kept speaking uh, about the practical experience side of it. Hmm. And internally I've, I've had such a practical experience and, and a walk and relationship with God that has grown over the last several years. But the external, um, I guess, the external fruit of it. How mm -hmm. do you, how do you go from the internal state to seeing it expressed externally? Or okay. if that um, makes sense. what would you what would you define external fruit as? Um, I, I guess you know when the word talks about walking in in fullness of life and, and fully healed and walking in abundance um, okay. to, to show the world that he's real and that he is good, that life is good following God. Um, I can express my internal state is incredible. Yeah. Um, but showing it in a way, like you just said, when we're, when we're teaching others who God's character really is having, having that trajectory shown in our lives and even, um, walking in the supernatural and um, mm. these supernatural experiences with God, these face-to-face -face encounters. Yeah. Um, if you start with your internal relationship with God and you develop and build that internal relationship with God in that he is in you, dwelling in you, and you open your life for that to expand within you, you'll ultimately discover the union of father, son, and spirit with your spirit, soul, body within your innermost being at the core of your being that opens up the realm of other experiences because you have it as the foundation and the source of abundant life. It is the source of your life. You're drinking from that. Well, it becomes a river in you and within the core of your being that begins to expand through you. Um, then you begin to demonstrate love out of what you've received. So the more you have that experience of unconditional love, the more you become unconditionally loving because what you've received, you express. So it's really, you know, my personal testimony of it all um, is probably not the best because it started with an experience that opened up the door to then the relationship growing. So I was taken into heaven in 2008 in an encounter that I was just sat at my desk and wasn't expecting. And it just happened. And it's like, I got sucked into heaven in a portal that opened up in my desk. And it was like, Whoa, where am I? What's going on? And literally, you know, I'm completely there. But the experience I had actually 
first, the very first thing that happened to me was an encounter with love at a completely different level than I'd ever experienced before. It was at a complete whole person experience, spirit, soul, body. I felt it, you know, everything encountered love. Like I became completely immersed and saturated and connected to love like never before. And that experience changed my whole life in that I knew something was more than I'd ever known before. And I pursued that. And for two years, I was like every day. So sort of like, okay, open. I was open. What am I? Where's this going to open again? How am I going to get back to that? Because it ruined me, you know. But actually, God was at work in me during that period, and then He then took me to to open that experience up to be a daily lifestyle in two thousand and ten. And so, two thousand and ten, I ended up engaging with God heaven opened up my experiences with him opened but he began to work in me so it was wonderful having experiences of being in heaven and being in the garden of god and in the waterfall and the river of life and all the wonderful things and the tree of life and amazing things but actually the key thing was i discovered he i was his dwelling place and as i dwelt uh, with him and he with me it help me understand myself i understood because he showed me my soul and how my soul functioned and how my soul was eventually needed to surrender because i was in control and i was forming my own identity from what i was doing and what i knew and all of that so eventually he got me to the point where i give up you know i don't need to know anything i just trust you and that then took me on another sort of wild ride of experience and encounter and but ultimately the daily experience of his first love of him loving me within expanded my whole being and i began to to know the truth of who i was within that relationship with him as i uh, learned to receive his love and he transformed me from the inside out so he began to work within my spirit soul body he began to bring about wholeness and and heal me in my soul and other areas and i'd had lots of inner healing and ministry and all over years but this was a completely different level because this was personal and him doing the healing and i just went along for the ride i just cooperated and i learned to embrace him in love i learned to be become in union with him you know he took me through a process that he took me to marriage if you like with him a union which was beyond what i would have ever even dreamed about but it started within so what you have within just engage that go with it let it grow and develop because it won't contain be contained within you it will begin to manifest through you, around you, in your life, in your relationships, because they will be a reflection of the relationship you have with God, you know, and you don't have to prove to anything, any, anyone, anything, you know, it's, it's up, it's God's role to bring about the realization that he's real. What we do within that is love people. You know, Jesus said, you will, they, the world will know you're my disciples for your love for one another. Now, Jesus said, you know, love one another as I have loved you. So the key to the whole thing is let him love you. Let him love you, show you your unconditionally love, remove any conditions you may have lodged within your psyche, because we all have mindsets which need renewing about our relationship with God. And it seems you're on that journey of deconstruction, but there may be more that god wants to do within you so the sort of external experiences of going into heaven and encountering spiritual things and seeing in the spirit and you know and i can do all of that and i've learned how to do all that and i've grown in that and therefore you know i can switch on my spiritual eyes and look at a room and see spiritual realities going on if i want to you know not that i do it very often because 
I don't need to. But I can because I my senses were trained to see in a different framework from the natural eyes. It talks about the Bible says we have the eyes of our heart. You know, we have a way of seeing and perceiving, which is not just physical. And that's to engage God and the, the supernatural realm around us and to engage that within. But I found that I don't have to externally go into heaven. I have a connection where I dwell in heaven. Everyone is seated with Christ in heavenly places. So your spirit is already operating in that realm. You may just not cognitively caught up with it yet. And for most people, they're never taught that. So therefore, they never really appreciate what the full realm of the spirit is for them and their whole spirituality in living in the spiritual realm. Because Jesus took us to that spiritual realm when he went to that spiritual realm in the ascension. Yeah, and we all went with him. We're all seated there with him, not in him, but with him. But where do you sit? in heaven you sit on a throne it's a position of identity and authority as a son you know so i learned all of that to uncover all of that in my journey but i discovered that at the core of my being that in the center of my being there are energy gates that god has given like we've got a blood system and we and a neuro system and all that we've got an energy system that is energized by life the river of life flowing in us that can energize us fully into wholeness, health, all of it. And that has within it portals to connect me with that realm, with the spiritual realm, with, with where I am in heavenly places. So it's a journey, but start with developing that first love intimacy of unconditional love within, and that will open up the rest. You know, so there is so much more, um, but it is a journey for all of us, you know, and each journey is unique. You know, it's not we're not clones. Therefore, the way God deals with me will be different from with you, but it will always be based in love. And he will always have our best interests and he always will try and bring good out of even the worst of decisions and things we make and do because he loves us. He's a God of mercy and grace. So his mercy will overwhelm everything. His mercy is triumphant over anything we might do or anyone else will do. And his grace is limitless. And his love is totally unconditional. And when we begin to rest in that, it will open up our life to so much more. Um, yeah, because we will experience so much more in that relationship. Yeah. Okay, so that's sort of a, you know, there's a book there to, to that subject, you know, um, you know, it, it can't really be answered in a few minutes. But, you know, I've, you know, I've done lots and lots of videos and things talking about my journey and the experiences that I had to get to that place. You know, and one of the keys is you know, the last book I wrote, which is um, Into the Dark Cloud was the turning point in my life where my soul came to surrender and trust God and everything was turbocharged after that. That was back in 2012. So from 2010 to 2012, sort of about an 18 month period, God began to get me to the point where, you know, I would give up, you know, my own soul's control system of maintaining my protection and everything else myself giving myself identity even if it was the identity of doing things god wanted me to do but i still validated it through my soul when i surrendered that things changed dramatically and that that's the sort of the story you know of that book the previous book was about engaging the father so it was my journey of sonship and they both go together in terms of developing what you're talking about a supernatural lifestyle you know, um, but it is a lifestyle of rest, you know, and just living in the rest of knowing God's love. And God gave me this little statement years ago, which I, you know, live on is live, you know, live loved, love living and live loving. Which means live loved by God unconditionally, love living, joyful life 
but also live loving in actually loving other people the way we've been loved by God. That means we live in forgiveness. We, we don't hold things against people. We live in a state of peace and rest within that relationship. Thank you for watching our YouTube channel. We really appreciate you taking the time. If you enjoy these videos, would you please take a moment to like, comment and subscribe? It really does help. Thank you very much.